Welcome to One Last Blade. In this video, I'm going to be talking about how to make a Grey Knight's List in 9th edition of Warhammer 40,000. The first thing I'll be talking about is resources. All of the various books and things that you need in order to make a list and play a Grey Knight's List properly. This codex is almost three years old and it is pretty out of date. You're not going to be using the points values from this. You're going to be using the points values from this, unless you're watching this video later than October of 2020 and they've reprinted points and sent. But right now, these are the relevant points. You're also going to be using this book for all of our good rules, bad rules, good rules. It's also strongly recommended by everybody in the Warhammer community that you use Battlescribe. I am going to assume that you aren't using Battlescribe because that would invalidate much of this video. This book, as I said, is supremely out of date as far as points, as far as some rules, and honestly, a lot of its lore isn't even super great. But uh, what this book does have is all of our data sheets. Um, it is important to look at these, to know these, and to reference them in mid-game. Everybody likes to reference them in Battlescribe or using some online resource, but nothing helps hammer home a rule better than looking at it physically in the book. For example, I have absolutely no idea how many base attacks a chaplain has. I've used him in probably seven, eight games, more than that. But I have no idea how many uh, attacks he has. I think he has a weapon skill of two, and I assume four attacks. Ah, he has three attacks. If I reference this, I'm going to know this. I'm going to know how many attacks he has a lot more than I'm not going to because I'm going to remember the page, I'm going to remember the look of things, I'm going to remember where I reference it, and eventually this will all just get burned in my mind. I feel like with Battlescribe and such, it tends to fall into the background. I tend to just rely on it all too much, and then I'm constantly clicking these things and clicking view and then waiting for it to load and then looking at my opponent while they're just like upset that I don't know my codex, trying to find the rules. If you reference this, it both looks better, it gives you some cool inspirational pictures, and you will learn the rules faster. I'm not exactly sure why, but it just works that way. But the points. The points in this book are all incorrect. Not a single one of these numbers is accurate. Uh, if you're a new Grey Knights player and you're stoked about playing these guys and you just picked up the codex because it looks cool and everybody tells you you need the codex, you might as well draw over this page of the Sharpie. None of it is relevant. Everything in here has been changed to what's in here. Which, if I can find... Ah! Very succinct. In fact, how does this match up to that? This is a lot more words. Is it just smaller print? I think it's just smaller print. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. There's all of our stuff. Anyway, these are the correct points. We're referencing this, not this. This is done once we know the rules in there, like I do. If you're in the store and you see this book, you might reasonably assume it is not a Grey Knight's book because there's a Dark Angel loser on the front, but there are six pages in this book that we want. Uh, I guess five if you don't need the Chaplain's new rules, but you do need the Chaplain's new rules because Chaplains are great. We'll talk about that in a minute. But this has all the new stratagems, uh, the new psychic powers, which are great, uh, and fancy new relics. And our litanies, again, with Chaplains. And then another picture and a Grey Knight's name generator, which can't imagine anybody using for any reason. So as far as army creation itself goes, I'm going to assume that you're going to be making a 2,000 point army. And for the purposes of this, I'm going to assume you want to make both a powerful and fluffy list. Uh, Grey Knights are an awesome force who have a ton of really cool stories and a lot of great lore. And it is a shame when you see the top tier lists running a bunch of Dreadnoughts or a bunch of Grandmaster Dreadnoughts and just sort of fluff is important in the game. So I'm going to be focusing on that. Uh, the first thing that we want to think about is the type of detachment we're going to bring. Gone are the days of, oh, I need to bring two battalions so that I can have a ton of command points to do stuff for. Now all you need is one detachment. Although that does present its own problem. Uh, Battalions have a limit of three HQs. We need HQs. You'll remember when I talked about the six pages of rules we have in this book, 
Ugh, the Dominus Disappointment. All of our fancy new psychic powers can only be taken by characters. Most characters are HQs. We're going to have a problem with that. So obviously we're going to be taking the Battalion, which means we need to take a minimum of three troops, and we might even throw a patrol or maybe a Vanguard Detachment in there, and I will explain why. The absolute minimum of a Battalion Detachment is two HQs and three troops. So I always start with my troops. My HQs, I'm, depending on who I'm facing or what type of game I'm planning on doing, I don't know what I want to bring HQ-wise, but I always know what I'm going to do with troops. I'm going to grab three Terminator units, um, start with bare bones, got some swords. Swords are great, and hopefully will be better eventually when uh, we catch up to the Space Marines Codex and also get a plus one strength on our swords, but for the moment, they're still AP3, they do a D3 damage, they're great. Bare Bones Terminator Squad. I will also grab another Bare Bones Terminator Squad with Halberds. Uh, from here, I have a couple of options. I've got two troops units. I'm probably going to grab this one because they are all falchions. These guys right here, I like them. They are old, fancy pewter models. Uh, they were a ton of fun to paint, but they got a mismatch of weapons and it makes rolling them hard. If you have a bunch of mismatched weapons in a squad, you're going to have to roll the swords separately, you're going to have to roll the halberd separately. It's just going to be a whole thing. Now I hear you saying, don't Grey Knights have another troop option? To which I say no. But I'm pretty sure that you have another troop option. I can see the picture. No. All Grey Knight troops are Terminators. Grey Knights are, at their core, super strong, super powerful, and really difficult to move. Strike squads are none of those things. They have a three-up save, they have one wound, and they just get torn down by shurikens. Eldar shurikens, which is a bad time. If ever you want to run a 600-year-old psychic warrior who has bested demons from across the universe, you don't want to see him taken down by a single Eldar shuriken. That is a shameful death that a faithful warrior of the Emperor does not deserve. So you're always going to be running Terminators. Eventually, maybe Strike Squads will have two wounds, but they don't for now. These guys do, and they have five up invulns. A note, though. I really like the extra attacks that Falchions give, but they're so expensive. These swords are free. These halberds are free. Falchions are two points each. Not for the pair, but each which means each of these guys is four points more than these guys. So rather than 190 points, these guys are 210, which is a lot to swallow for five extra attacks. Sometimes those extra attacks are useful, but most of the time, you're already spending 600 points on your troops. Anything else you throw in there is just going to be hard to swallow. I've argued with people online about this. They're saying that it's clearly two points for the pair, but it says Nemesis Falchion without an S, two points. Which means each of those Falchions is two points. It is too expensive for me to swallow. So I'm gonna take back what I just said, I'm gonna push aside my Falchion boys, and I'm gonna keep Squad Archaeus, my old pewter boys. We have our basic troops out of the way. We might add more troops later, but for now, we need to choose our HQs, because again, we want to get the basis of the battalion down. Three troops, two HQs. HQs are very, very important for Grey Knights. They can cast all of our Dominus powers, which are really good, um, but depending on who we want, depending on who we're fighting, we'll decide what we want. You hopefully have a bevy of HQ options to choose from. A couple of brother captains, perhaps. A Grand Knight of the On Foot, or in the Nemesis Dread Knight flavor. Uh, maybe a Brotherhood Champion. Maybe a Tech Marine. Maybe a Chaplain. Maybe some named characters. But, I'm going to be honest, I don't run named characters. One of the big things I love about Warhammer 40,000 is that my army feels like mine. I feel like they are special. I feel like they are representative of... I don't know, something in my mind. I give them stories, I give them backgrounds. These guys are the Seventh Brotherhood. They are led by Grand Master Samandis. Uh, they all have the same little pattern on all of their shields. Drago just doesn't fit in there. I don't even have a Grand Master Voldis or a Stern or anything like that. So honestly, I would only run Drago before. And I ran him in uh, LVO this last year because he's so good. 
or he was so good. The only change that we got in the giant FAQ that came out with the new Space Marine Codex is telling us that Drago's Storm Shield no longer gives him a 3-up invuln. He is a 4-up invuln, like everybody else. So, there is no reason to take Drago. Set your name characters aside. This is your list, and you are building it because you like your guys. For versatility, I am going to take a Brother Captain. They are huge beat sticks. They have five attacks, they have a four up invuln, and on top of that, they give a nice buff to everybody else. Every Grey Knight, every Grey Knight unit in six inches gets to double their smite range, which is different from the captains in most Space Marines. They don't get to reroll ones, but it's super handy. A 24 inch smite, especially if you're dealing two damage with Tide of Escalation, is excellent. So I'm gonna take a brother captain. I'm taking this guy over this guy, as rad as he is, because this guy, has a halberd, giving him five strength, and I think I might be giving him the uh, soul glaive as well. Here you go, buddy. So who else? Grandmasters are good. They're the ones who give us the reroll ones in six inches. We don't have a lieutenant's equivalent, so we really gotta rely on this. Grandmasters on foot are nice to hold in your back line, or have deep striking with some uh, terminators or paladins up the field. Uh, the fact that they can latently deep strike and get thrown around the board with Gate of Infinity is very, very nice. A lot of people don't rate these guys just because they're okay. They're uh, six wounds. They have a four up invuln, only T4. As far as HQs go, they could be a lot deadlier, but he's got a really small footprint. If you're teleporting him around the field or you're deep striking him, he can fit in a lot more places than something bigger like a Grandmaster Nemesis Dread Knight, but a lot of benefits to bringing a Grandmaster and a Nemesis Dread Knight, though. Uh, he's toughness six, he has 12 wounds, and he has a four Binvuln natively. He also, like the on-foot Grandmaster, knows one spell and can cast two. So if you give him the Lore Master trait, he can know two and cast two, which means he could always be casting Sanctuary on himself, giving himself pretty much permanent uh, three up Binvuln, doing something else like Vortex of Doom or Hammer Hand, although, he is rocking 10 strength with the sword, so he probably usually won't need Hammerhand. In any case, uh, this dude can do pretty much everything that he can do, except for the fact that his footprint's bigger. Very commonly, I will deep strike this guy into somebody's back line, have him cast Sanctuary on himself, and then he's just a T6, 12 wound unit with a three up invuln that has to be dealt with, because if he gets in somewhere, he is going to destroy them in melee. Uh, using the... Oh, what's the new Dread Knight stratagem called? Overwhelming Assault. Using Overwhelming Assault, this guy can get up to, let's see, five plus one from Shock Assault, plus one from Overwhelming Assault, seven attacks with a Strength 10 AP3 D6 weapon. Uh, he will destroy pretty much anything he comes into contact to, and he will become known around your tabletops for being a terror that has to be dealt with. And now I've spoken him up, so I'm gonna bring him, put him in the list. Grandmaster Nemesis Dread Knight. Overwhelming Assault. Using Overwhelming Assault, this guy can get up to, let's see, five plus one from Shark Assault, plus one from Overwhelming Assault, seven attacks with a Strength 10 AP3 D6 weapon. Uh, he will destroy pretty much anything he comes into contact to, and he will become known around your tabletops for being a terror that has to be dealt with. And now I've spoken him up, so I'm gonna bring him, put him in the list. Grandmaster Nemesis Dread Knight. It's a battalion, so we got one more spot for an HQ. I'm not quite sure who we're gonna be doing yet. Uh, we got a lot of options here. Uh, I'm probably not gonna be doing another Brother Captain. Uh, the I'm already getting the extended smite range from him, and honestly, if he doesn't have a relic and he's not providing me with that, Brother Captain doesn't do a whole lot. Goodbye, son. Tech Marines. Tech Marines are okay. They are cheap. They are very, very, very cheap. And they are still psychers, and he's a character. So you can give him powers that you wouldn't want to be giving more of your combat-based characters, such as uh, Imperian Domination to get you another command point, or perhaps uh, Warp Shaping so that you can switch out between the various tides of the warp. Um, he also can heal my Dread Knight if I need him to. But if I'm not bringing any other vehicles, he's not going to provide a whole lot. So we're going to set him in a maybe pile. Brotherhood Champion. What a weird, weird unit. 
I used to love bringing him because he had a 4-up invuln and you could cast Sanctuary on him and then you could have him do his Blade Shield stance in combat and give himself a 2-up invuln. But they removed all options for 2-up invulns from the Grey Knights Codex. And also, we're the only chapter whose champions are not elites. So he's taken up a valuable HQ slot. Very rarely has he ever actually done anything in battle. He also isn't wearing Terminator armor, so he can't deep strike latently. Uh, actually, now that I think about it. Huh. Strike squads. Guys also in power armor. They have teleport strike. Why, why don't you have teleport strike, Brotherhood Champion? Why aren't they letting you into the teleportarium chambers? Well, anyway, you could deep strike him with a command point if you want, but that's not worth it. Sorry, buddy. Maybe in the future. Chaplains. Chaplains are very cool. Chaplains have so many new abilities. It's basically like a whole another list of psychic powers. The litanies. Litanies of purity. There's a lot of really cool options in here. I haven't spent a ton of time with a bunch of different ones because COVID-19 happened and I haven't been able to use this book as much as I wanted to. But I have had really good experience with the refrain of convergence, giving him a total of plus four after his uh, Grey Knight's normal plus one to uh, deny the witch attempt, helping me to control the psychic phase a lot more. I've also really enjoyed words of power with certain models. Uh, he can help nemesis weapons reroll ones for damage if you just want to kill something in melee, or he can help dreadnoughts reroll their last cannons, which has been really helpful. He also just looks cool, and again, he can take a Dominus power so he can sit in your backfield, get you command points, shift the tides, things like that. I really rate these guys, but I'm going to put him in the maybe, because I got another option. My Grandmaster on foot. But hold on, I already have a Grandmaster. Maybe I could put two in my list, then I can get two reroll ones bubbles. One in my backfield and one with my deep strikers. That sounds like a great tactic, but no, not going to do that. Because there are only eight Grandmasters total in the entire chapter. And I have a really hard time believing that more than one of them will be on any given battlefield at any time. Unless it is like an apocalypse-style scenario in which I bring my entire army. However, if I'm just doing a 2,000-point match against Eldar or something, I'm... It is a hard pill to swallow to bring two Grandmasters. I strongly doubt that even, like, one would show up to most of these smaller engagements that we do if I'm just fighting Imperial Guard or something. But... It's very rare that I will bring two Grandmasters. So, sorry, Samandis, you're going to be sitting this one out. Hold on, what's that last model? That isn't a Grey Knight. What is that? It's an Inquisitor. Inquisitors can add some nice flexibility into our army, and especially since you can include one in a Grey Knight's list for one command point without breaking any of our special uh, army rules, particularly the Tides of the Warp. That is essential to keep us going. But, uh... Back to Inquisitors. Inquisitors can add some nice flexibility into our army, and especially since you can include one in a Grey Knights list for one command point without breaking any of our special uh, army rules, particularly the Tides of the Warp. That is essential to keep us going. An Inquisitor will happily trot alongside all of your Grey Knights and maybe provide a few good bonuses. They have a few powers that are handy. Um, they can steal command points from enemy characters, they can turn off Overwatch, they can adjust leadership, none of which is super valuable for us, but they do one thing that is really important. Well, hello, Warpcraft secondaries. I would never waste a Grey Knight's entire psychic phase to use you, but guess what? 60-ish points, and she can do it. Nobody's going to be denying our Warcraft secondaries when we have so many psychic powers that they're going to want to shut down. Most armies that we face against are going to be having one, maybe two, maybe in a rare case, three psychers. And they are not going to be spending their denials to make it so that I don't get psychic ritual off. They're going to be spending it to make sure I don't get Sanctuary or Hammerhand or any of my really powerful Dominus powers. What is happening over there? What are you doing? No, oh, he's got a toy. If you have 60 to 70 points, uh, I would suggest taking along an Inquisitor just to help you get those little uh, Warpcraft secondaries. 
Don't take the Ordo Malleus Inquisitor in Terminator armor, though. She's great, but she's very expensive. And the Demon Hammer and the Psych Cannon are just not worth the points. So goodbye to you. Let's include you, though. That would be nice. Moving on to Elites. We have some really nice Elite options in this army. What are you doing here, Purifiers? You're in power armor. You're not supposed to be in this army. Get out of here. Your rules aren't good yet, and I doubt they ever will be. Anyway, the elites of this army. Paladins are the backbone of the army. These guys will destroy anything that they touch, and they will ruin the day of anything that they can shoot at. It's 40 bolter shots. It's a heck ton of halberds, hammers, all sorts of things. I bring 10 of them. Whenever I bring paladins, I either bring zero or I bring 10. Uh, I outfit a couple of them with these right here, the warding staves, uh, just so that in melee, they have a four up invulnerable, usually gonna be a three up invulnerable because I've cast Sanctuary on them. And I always make sure that Justicar, no, what is he called? Paragon, the Paragon, the sergeant equivalent of the squad has the Nemesis Demon Hammer because where the rest of the squad has a three up weapon skill, he has a two-up weapon skill, so he just turns into a three-up with his buddies when he takes the hammer. Um, you might be looking at this squad of ten and be like, wait a minute, last, but who cares? You have two-up armor saves. You have three wounds. Take the extra shots from Blast. You're going to be okay because you're buffing the hell out of these guys. In a perfect situation, you've got all of these buffs on them. You've cast a few powers. Hammer hand to give them plus one to wound in the fight phase. Sanctuary to up their five up invuln to a four up invuln, or sometimes a three up invuln with them. Uh, you've used armored resilience uh, as well in order to give them uh, minus one to being wounded. And then when the phases come around, you are using Redoubtable Defense to reduce the damage they take by one, and you are using Fury of the Proven to make sure they all hit on twos. These guys become unkillable, and they kill literally anything they touch. That and the fact that they're denying a lot of powers that come their way, they are a very good unit, and I will definitely include them. They also eat command points for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You're going to start with 12. You're going to be generating one, maybe two, with Empyrean Domination uh, every round, and these guys are still going to go to town. At the end of turn two or three, you might have three command points yet left because these guys are going to be just consuming them. Other elite options. Ancients are very good. A Grey Knight's banner gives everybody in six inches one extra attack. Uh, the whole unit, which is really, really good. So your paladins are going to get four attacks base or five when you charge with them. There are two types of Ancients. There's the Brotherhood Ancient. Uh, he has a three-up weapon skill and ballistic skill and only three attacks. And then we've also got the Paladin Ancient, who is better in every aspect. There is no downside. Inexplicably, the Brotherhood Ancient and the Paladin Ancient are the exact same points. So you're always going to be taking a Paladin Ancient. There's literally no reason to take a Brotherhood Ancient. As far as equipping him, he is not the best in combat. He has four attacks, which is fine, but honestly, he's probably not going to be getting there. You're going to be advancing him around the board so he can smite, and so he can give everybody more attacks. So giving him a falchion used to be free, uh, but now it is two points. So goodbye, you. Hello, you. We've talked very little about relics and things like that so far, but before I put him away... I want to mention that one of the better Grey Knight's relics is the Banner of Refining Flame. It gives him a 6-inch smite, but the smite always does a d6 mortal wounds, which is pretty good. Especially, boom, 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 combos. When matched with a brother captain who is going to be able to double his range. Uh, I tend to deep strike them together. They come down with some Terminators or with some Paladins. Uh, he provides everybody a little bit of a smite boost, which I'm not going to be using because I'm putting them with 9 inches away so they can try to make charges. But... Whatever I land next to is going to be taking d6 mortal wounds. Unless he's denied, of course. Sometimes you take smaller paladin squads just to, like, hold points and to really take out something or protect characters. However, these guys, uh, I modeled them with lightning claws because I thought it would be a fun falchion proxy. Falchions are, in my opinion, bad. So sorry, guys. Over there. The Humble Apothecary. He's in Terminator armor, so he can deep strike. He has a two-up weapon skill, and he's only 80 points. So he is a character who can cast more of those really valuable Dominus powers, and whoosh, 
throw a 15-point Nemesis Demon Hammer on him, and you got yourself a 95-point character who has a 3-up with a Demon Hammer. He's going to be wrecking house and healing himself every turn, or risking healing one of these guys at the risk of doing nothing. I don't think the revival rules are very good, but what you're primarily going to be doing is this power right here with this stratagem and this stratagem. By using dynamic insertion, the apothecary can smash down into your opponent's line pretty much anywhere he wants, as long as it's three inches away from an enemy model. Because uh, he has such a tiny footprint, you will most of the time be able to find a space for him, unless you're facing like Tyranids and they've covered the board with it. But the vast majority of armies, boom, you can plop him down pretty much next to something that you want to destroy. Then you'll be using the inner fire spell, which you might notice has a range of one inch. If you use the powerful adept stratagem, it increases the range to seven inches. Then you'll be rolling all your dice, you'll be using whatever stratagems you need, you'll be, maybe you gave him the sanctic shard and he's getting an additional plus one to his casts. On average, with inner fire, jumping in, targeting characters, he does seven to ten mortal wounds. He does one or two to himself, but with his Narthesium, he's just take, healing those wounds back up next turn. This guy has one me games, deep striking into somebody's back lines, killing a tank, killing a valuable HQ, destroying psychers, just wiping out infantry. He usually dies immediately after that because whoever he's killed is furious and wants to remove him so that he can't do any more of that. But honestly, for 80 to 95 points, touching down in somebody's backfield and deleting something important, this guy is invaluable. All right, this is a bunch so far uh, without those guys. I'm gonna add up these points and we'll see where we're at. Okay, 1676 so far out of 2000. This is what I would consider like a good core force. Like this is something that I would feel comfortable bringing and I've got my paladins to touch down or get teleported across the board, destroy whatever they want. This guy's here for support and also gonna be doing a lot of damage with the relic banner assisted by him. So I'm probably throwing these guys in deep strike and absolutely him in Deep Strike, because he's in a touchdown and Kamehameha something to death. Then I've got my uh, Terminators, who are going to be claiming objectives, sitting in terrain, and being really tough to kill. And then Grandmaster Nemesis Dread Knight, who I might elect to give a uh, Dread Knight Teleporter to, which is why I kind of erased that on here. It's 10 points. Thinking about it. Might want to Deep Strike him as well. But this is my essentially like core force, my Inquisitor, to be getting uh, those psychic secondaries for me. So I have roughly 300 points to play with. This is a lot more than 300 points over here. I'm just going to kind of go through the rest of these options and at this point it's kind of me cherry picking what I want based off of the opponent I have. But these guys right here, Terminators, Paladins, support characters, this is what I want. So depending on who I'm fighting or the playstyle I want to do, I have some options I'm going to choose from. Dreadnoughts are very good. Our Dreadnoughts are Psychic, which makes them even better. So these Dreadnought, this Dreadnought, he has a Twin Lance Cannon and a Missile Launcher, and I always, without fail, give him Astral Aim. So he can shoot through walls, ignore cover, ignore line of sight, and just pretty much kill tanks. I say pretty much kill tanks, but I'm thinking of my game against Eldar I did this last weekend, and he whiffed two turns in a row and didn't kill a single vehicle. And there were... Five Eldar tanks? Five Eldar tanks. So maybe not today, buddy. Fill up a land raider with a squad of five Terminators, supporting character of choice, and then teleported upfield with Gate of Infinity, and you've got a pretty nasty ball of fairly survivable hate in your opponent's back line. These flamers are fortunately 12 inches, and they will roast anything they come into contact with. And then, even if it's destroyed, you get some Terminators piling out. However, oh man, transport pops and a Terminator dies. You feel bad. You roll some ones on that disembarkation, and you lose 40 points. You roll two, you lose 80. It, it's, it's not great. But again, Land Raiders are really, really cool. I think that they do a lot of work with obscuring terrain and with the uh, fact that they can shoot into uh, combat. I think that the Land Raiders are a lot better than they used to be. They might still not be the best, but the last few games I've played with this guy, he's survived two or three turns, which never used to be the case. 
Nemesis Dread Knights. These are so red. I used to hate them so much. I thought they were the dumbest looking things, which is why I have my Grandmaster a special kit bash with a Redemptor so that he looks unique. But I think they look so cool now. After I painted these guys, I am much happier with the design than they used to be. Uh, they can take a couple of different weapons. We've got our heavy incinerator here, which doesn't see a lot of play in the competitive scene, but God, I really like that auto hitting. Even if it's only a D6 shot, so you can reroll that with the CP if you need to. And it's just really nice at its strength six, AP two, two damage. I am not sure what the purpose of a silencer is at the moment, be it the Gatling silencer or the regular infantry silencer. It's a 24 inch weapon. 12 shots, strength 4, AP 0, D3. I don't know what that profile is supposed to kill. I think infantry, when I hear strength 4 and AP 0, but D3 damage, most stuff that, a that strength 4, AP 0 is going against is not going to need D3 damage. So maybe vehicles, but then you've got no AP and you have such a low strength. All right, maybe characters are what it's really going after. But again, you're lacking the AP that a lot of multi-wound characters really need you to chew through. So I'm just not sure what a silencer goes for. On the smaller units, there might be an argument made for uh, using a silencer because you can use Tide of Convergence on them. But for some inexplicable reason, Tide of Convergence only works with infantry. So Dread Knights can't benefit from that, which means they don't get any bonuses unless you spend two CP on a Psychic Onslaught to make their Psychic weapons a little bit more powerful, which two CP on one guy shooting better isn't, isn't great for me. However, especially with Tide of Shadows, these guys are a lot more survivable than they used to be in 8th edition, and in melee they wreck house. As I mentioned, strength 10, AP 3, D6 damage, and the two fists, pretty good. On the charge, that dude's getting 6 attacks, uh, strength 12, AP 2, and D3 damage. That wrecks a lot of stuff, especially Eldar jet bikes, which everyone hates in the world. I like them. I will give them teleporters sometimes. I'll plop them down in the backfield with my Grandmaster and his Nemesis Dread Knight. Feels like his little cohort going with him. Uh, and this is a scary little, uh, scary little blob that's going up. Dedicated transports. I don't take power armor, so I don't need dedicated transports. Then we've got our flyers, which are also in a really awkward spot these days. The Storm Raven in particular. Take all of the problems that everybody has with Land Raiders, give the Land Raider T7, only a 3-up save, and then tell me that the Land Raider can't hide behind Obscuring Terrain. And you have a Storm Raven. Maybe 300 points or so, and I have never not seen it die on turn 1. Sometimes if I go first, it flies up field, uh, ruins things, and then just dies again. But, as I mentioned before, it's got some pretty valuable cargo. Cargo that dies on ones loses me 40 points when I do so, and it can't re-roll in 9th edition. So, there's something to be said for it. I think it's a very cool model. I think it's a really cool idea, transporting uh, Terminators, and maybe a Dreadnought or two. Just one, I don't know why I said two. Up the board, and grabbing some points, really smashing some face. They just die so quick, and then all of your Paladins fall out and then just sitting in your zone, and then what are you going to do with them? You just lost 300 points. These two are also flyers and also in a weird spot because of that. Uh, they can't grab objectives, which sucks, but uh, if you're fighting Eldar, I don't know why my mind's on Eldar today, maybe because I got spanked by them last weekend, but if you're fighting Eldar in particular, or Tau, anything with a lot of, with a lot of fly keyword, the Stormhawk Interceptors do work. They have a latent plus one against flying uh, units and also their guns, the Icarus Storm Cannon and the Storm Hammer Missile Launchers get plus one. So you're getting plus two. So you're accounting for any minuses that like Harlequin vehicles have and also getting an additional plus one. So these guys, I played against Harlequins a couple weeks ago and these guys ruined all of their bikes. It was very, very satisfying. And you've got some weird shenanigans you can do with our Power Edict Imperator that allows something to move twice, where it can shoot, then move off the board into strategic reserves, and then come back in the following turn, essentially protecting it for an entire turn. There's some weird stuff to be done with this. Ooh, I bet I could do that with the Storm Raven. Oh, maybe I could, no. 
Stormhaven is a trap. I don't want to think about it. But these guys, they're not too expensive. And, oh, I just realized. I just got the new Space Marine Codex the other day. Let's see if their rules have changed. Yeah, their rules are all sorts of different now. Their Icarus Storm Cannons make more attacks as opposed to hitting better. It looks like they've lost the Interceptor rule entirely, so they don't get any bonuses to hit against flying vehicles. But that doesn't matter, because these are Grey Knight's Stormhawk Interceptors. Goodbye, Space Marine book. We don't get any of the fun updates the Space Marines get. Our Terminators didn't get additional wounds, our Power Armor guys didn't get additional wounds, and also, these guys are two Space Marine codices out of date, so they still have the weird Infernum Halo launchers that let them reroll ones for saves. I'm sure at some point they'll be updated, but for now, I like what they do. I'll keep using them. So to finish off my list, uh, I've included two more choices. Uh, I threw in my Venerable Dreadnought with the Laz Cannon and the Missile Launcher so that I have some anti-vehicle, and thrown in a Chaplain there. So I have a bunch of characters who can cast uh, the Dominus spells, which will be great. Um, however, I am now in the awkward Grey Knight's point of being just about 50 points left. <laughs> There's no unit in the Grey Knights Codex bar servitors uh, that can swallow up those last 50 points. So I can either augment squads we have or do something weird. I opted for something weird and something that I recommended against, which was just putting in Ordo Malleus Inquisitor and Terminator armor. This is a clean uh, 2,000 points now. Um, so, Basically what I did here was get my three troops units, uh, find two HQs to get the bare minimum, start filling out the other units that I think I need, such as my deep striking bomb, my anti-vehicle, and then I started to put in, uh, fill out the rest of my characters. The next step I take is figuring out my warlord, uh, my relics, and my psychic powers. Choosing a warlord is always a contentious thing for me. Everything in my bones is telling me to make him my warlord. I gave him the uh, Dread Knight Teleporter so he can deep strike with some of my other deep striking units, namely the Paladins, to give them rerolls. So it follows that I want to give him the warlord trait, the only good warlord trait the Grey Knights have. First to the fray, reroll failed charge rolls. Oh, I hate looking at this page because everything else just makes me so sad. Lore Master? Sure, he knows one additional power. It's not good. What? Hammer of Righteousness? Add one to wound rolls? in the fight phase, if he charged, what, just on one guy, unyielding, what, pa automatically pass morale, we're space, what is this garbage, what are we looking at? Uh, traditionally, a Grandmaster does not lead his forces in combat, he leaves that job to the Brother Captain, the Grandmaster obviously being the highest ranking in the Brotherhood, it can assume control, but typically he leaves the tactical aspect of a battle to the Brother Captain. So I will make my Brother Captain my Warlord. Um, it feels bad because he's going to be a better choice. But I'm going to do it anyway. He has the banner of Finding Flame. Uh, if he's next to him, it can increase to 12 inches. So if I deep strike the two of them, boom, that's a big ol' uh, big ol' smite bomb. Um, I'm also going to be spending one CP in order to give another relic to my group. And the other relic I'm going to give, mm, I've only got a few options, and I'm giving him the Sanctic Shard so that I can have another Mortal Wound Bomb. Again, that's part of the uh, combo of doing Inner Fire, uh, Powerful Adapt, and Dynamic Insertion on the same guy. So he's going to come in Wreck Face, hopefully. The next two steps of my list creation are intertwined. Who am I deep striking? And remembering that I can only deep strike half of my army. And who's getting what psychic powers? Depending on where people go is where it is very important. First, I set aside everything that is necessary to be in deep strike, which is three characters so far. Obviously, my Kamehameha assassin, that's what he's going to be doing. These two are going to be using their whole flag and range extending combo. But now I just have a bunch of exposed characters. We're maybe midway through 700 points at this point once we throw the Paladin Squad in there. Uh, the Paladin Squad has obvious benefits of bringing into Deep Strike uh, alongside these guys uh, because it's a big blob of indestructible Terminators. Uh, they'll be able to protect them. However, one thing. First to the fray. Gives a 6-inch reroll. If I bring these Paladins, I'm going to be charging with them, and I'm going to get one reroll. So I have two chances to make a 9-inch charge out of Deep Strike. 
if I deep strike all three squads of my Terminators, and I happen to land this guy so that they're all within six inches of him, that gives me six chances to make a nine inch charge, which is a lot better. Um, plus, spares me some points, I can also deep strike my Inquisitor and get her into the point where she can start uh, doing some of those Warcraft secondaries. I like this. What that leaves on the field for me would be my Chaplain, who I want him to be on the ground anyway, because he needs to start doing his litanies at the beginning of the battle round. Paladin Blob, uh, a Dreadnought, and my Grandmaster. Although, wait a minute, I think this is too few units. I think you have to do half the units now as well. No more than half the total number of units in your army can be strategic, reserve, and or reinforcement units and the combined points value, blah, 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 blah. Ah, dang it. Okay, so this is less than a thousand points, but too many guy, too many individual units. However, that just means there's things to consider. Maybe leave a Terminator squad on the field to hold an objective. Maybe uh, one match, take the Paladins into space. Uh, if you're doing a tournament situation where you do have to have your list decided beforehand, uh, him having the teleporter is going to be important to be. Sometimes you want to put him into space, sometimes you don't. But yeah, um, again, psychic powers are decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Traditionally, I will give these guys Gave Infinity because it sucks when they deep strike somewhere or they're thrown somewhere and then they sit in the corner of the board all by themselves and their 5-inch move can't get them where you want to. Um, I will mix up Dominus powers with all of my various characters, although he always has Sanctuary because having that threw up in bonus choice on him. He's always got uh, astral aim, so he can always shoot through walls. Typically, all of my Terminator squads have Gate of Infinity. That is an empower that it is important to double down on. Uh, redundancy is really, really important with Gate of Infinity. Uh, if you lose some guys and you suddenly have no access to Gate of Infinity at all, then you've lost one of the key strengths of your army, which is mobility. Grey Knights, we are slow on foot, but we can teleport anywhere we want, take objectives, charge again, and teleport out of combat, and start shooting, which is great. Um, he has Smite, so I'm not really going to be caring about what his powers are. Chaplain's holding back, so he's going to have something like either Warp Shaping or uh, Imperial Domination to just help out. Nothing that he needs to target with. Always inner fire. <sighs> Grab Bag, who knows what he's going to take. Maybe Armored Resilience to give the Paladins even more durability. Anyway, that's kind of how my brain works when I'm making a list. Uh, I'm constantly considering the points values, uh, whether or not I'm going to deep strike something, and their psychic powers, uh, and I always have core units that I never want to, uh, that I never want to leave home without. And then I like to make things fluffy. Now I have a mess, and I'll have to take care of this. <laughs>